Good evening, everyone. Good evening. If you could take your seats, we're going to get started in about 30 seconds. Thank you. Well, I understand I'm on the program. If you are an elected or a representative for elected, if you could come sit in the front row. That would be uh, much appreciated. Gotcha. Okay. show on the road. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. All right, there we go. My name is Dante Arnwine. I am the district manager for Brooklyn Community Board 9. It's a pleasure to be here this evening with all of you. Thank you all for making it out for this town hall to discuss the SUNY Downstate transformation. I want to take this opportunity to welcome everyone again. I want to welcome the elected officials that are attending uh, with us tonight. Uh, if you are a representative from elected official, thank you uh, for participating as well. For other community members, uh, representatives, clergy, thank you all uh, for being here. I also want to give a special shout out to any board members from Brooklyn Community Board 9 and Brooklyn Community Board 17 who are in attendance. All right. At this time, I also want to give a special shout out to my colleague, Sheree Frazier, the district manager at CB17. We work closely as DM, so I just want to give you a shout out. Thank you, sir. I want to remind people that this is a place of assembly. Again, this is a place of assembly. We're here to discuss what may likely be different viewpoints on this topic. I just want to remind everyone to be respectful when people are speaking don't like what the person is saying, I would encourage you to refrain from booing, let them finish their thoughts so we can get through this in a timely fashion. Uh, again, if you are interested in speaking, we will be closing the speakers list a little bit through uh, the session here. If you plan on speaking, the speakers list is over on that table. Speakers get two minutes, two minutes. So if you plan to speak, Make your way over there to sign up, and then uh, the chair will read the list uh, later in the session. Okay. All right, just a little bit of housekeeping items. I want to just let everyone know that Brooklyn Community Board 9 is hosting a tax town hall with the IRS, BPL, Grow Brooklyn. 
uh, which is going to be on Wednesday at the Brooklyn Public, uh, excuse me, at the Crown Heights uh, BPL uh, branch. We have flyers over there. Also, we're doing a campaign with the American Red Cross to get smoke alarm for people's uh, apartments. If you know anyone who might need the service, reach out to the board office and we will uh, connect you to that information. Our email address is bk09-1 at cb.nyc.gov. Our phone number is 718-778-9279. With that, I hand it now to the chair of Brooklyn Community Board 9, Fred Baptiste. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, and I really want to give more applause for our district manager, Mr. Dante Arnwine. I'm a Leo. Come on now, come on. He got the good mic. Okay. Uh, and as I do that, I also do want to thank the district manager from CB17, Mr. Sheree Frazier, as well. Those are the people who work behind the scenes who make a tick on a daily basis. As I do that as well, I also want to thank our community board staff. I want to thank our assistant district manager, Ms. Mia Hilton, and our community associate, Mr. Uh, Khalid Jamat. Um, I also want to thank. <laughs> thank you very much for that. I also want to thank Community Board 17. I want to thank my colleague, Chair Roger Daly. I want to thank my board. I want to thank the board for CB17. Um, this is really an important occasion. I want to thank everyone for finding that library to come this evening to, to talk about this. SUNY Downstate is an important piece of the community. There is a catchment in Brooklyn of over 1.2 million people, which means that any actions that happen on that site are critical and affect that many people, which means it's something that is worthy and important for us to discuss. Um, I did want to make a quick public service announcement with regards to SUNY Downstate. They did issue a survey. So at any point, if anyone wishes to, to give commentary to SU directly to SUNY, they can go to HTTPS, a stronger downstate.org. There is a survey there that they are asking for people to, to, uh, to, 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 uh, to fill out. I wanted to give a little bit of, uh, I wanted to give some very quick background with respect to how, uh, what steps we took to get here. Uh, I do want to say that, you know, basically this is something that as a board chair, I found out first time February 1st, in which there was a meeting that was held with a number of community stakeholders that was collect conducted at uh, Lenox Baptist Church. Um, the follow-up to that happened uh, with a meeting with uh, the Chancellor of SUNY, John King, which was attended by myself, chair of uh, CB17 as well, as well as our district managers, where we were given some additional information, uh, where they outlined this transformation plan that has been proposed. The next step that happened in that was a, an engagement meeting, which happened on the 23rd, I believe. And then the last step, oh, I'm sorry, that happened on the 23rd, and the last step in that, uh, in this uh, chain uh, was the 27th, where there was an engagement meeting held with a number of stakeholders. Again, I attended that, and I understand that there were a number of other community engagement meetings that happened. Critical to this conversation is that this meeting is the one that has not happened in which it came directly to the community, where the feedback was solicited directly from the community, which is why we found it important that we initiate this conversation so we can really, one, share information in terms of what we know or what has been shared, and then two, more importantly, get the feedback from the community in terms of what is desired. Um, again, I think it cannot be understated the importance of SUNY Downstate, and this is a conversation that cannot be had in under a month and a half. But with that, I want to turn it over. I, again, I thank everyone for coming this evening. I'm going to turn it over to uh, my counterpart for a few remarks as well, and then we're going to proceed with the program. So we're going to have some information that's going to be shared from a number of important people who have information and viewpoints with respect to that. We have a number of elected officials who have shown up here this evening to be with us, to, to listen to us and share what they know. And we thank them in advance, and we thank them again when they speak. Uh, and then the most important piece, again, we want to get the feedback from the community in terms of what is it you want to know? What information is missing for us to make a decision of this kind of, of this magnitude? Uh, and with that, I turn it over to Chair of CB17, Mr. Roger Dale. Good evening. Um, I'm really excited to, to, to be here, to listen to the community, see what it is that they want. Before I do that, um, 
I want to make sure that I recognize our, our board members from CB17 that are here, including our first vice chair, our second vice chair, um, first vice chair, uh, Asher Cunningham, our second vice chair, uh, June Prasad, our chair, uh, Rose Graham, and our chair of uh, budget is um, that Daniel McCabe, and our district manager, who um, Chairman Baptiste recognized, which is um, Chair Fra uh, District Manager Frazier. I, I don't know if I'm missing anyone from CB17. Oh, Chair Reed, um, right there, um, as well, who's chair. She does the hospital piece um, for us. Yes, and I can't see who that is. Huh? Oh, and Chair um, Montserrat Oni from Social Services, we're here. So, and also to recognize all of our elected officials, which I'm sure you, you have already done, we're sitting here, and again, giving honor and credence for all of you who are, who are here um, to support the conversations around Downstate. Recognizing that SUNY Downstate is in a trifecta of hospitals, right? We have Kings County, SUNY Downstate, and we have King County. Knowing that each of these three hospitals have issues, right, that we really have to address in our community. Knowing that SUNY Downstate is um, the only teaching hospital in Brooklyn, Right, so we have to recognize that as well. I am, um, some of you know me already, know me personally, know that I'm ill. I go to Sloan Catering. I have to go to Manhattan to get services. They have up-to-date services for me to have. One of the issues and the questions I constantly ask is why not us? Why not Community Board 9? Why not Community Board 17? Why not Community Board 18? Those are questions that I ask on a consistent basis within our own community. And, and looking at the people that we serve is also important, right? What kind of community we serve? We, we are in a very strong Caribbean, black, Afro-American, community, that let's, let's talk it like it is, right? The majority of our community is African-American Caribbean descent, first or second generation um, Americans. And it always seems to me, and I, and I argue this all the time, that I question that, that within our community, why constantly being underserved for a number of reasons. I will continue I will speak a little bit later. I'm, I'm not gonna talk for much longer, but I'll speak a little bit later on what we look at at Community Board 17. And I know that our first vice chair, uh, Asha Cunningham, will be coming up as well to speak. And then we'll address it. But the most important thing, like Chair Baptiste said, what do you, as a, if you don't speak up and speak out, if you constantly remain silent, then you'll get nothing and all you're gonna do is complain. So we don't want to complain in. This is an opportunity for you to express yourself, share your voices, and share your views. Don't let Chairman Baptiste, Chairman Daly, Bar President um, Reynoso, Congresswoman Clark, and Assemblymember um, Cunningham hog the mic and hog the conversation, right? It's what you want because they're here to listen to you as well. And they want to hear from you. Because when they go back to their respective offices, they want to have that conversation. And I did see um, our member, uh, Monique, Water Monique Channel Waterman's office is here as well. So please, don't let we have to ask. Come up and talk, don't be scared. Don't. This is not the time to, what do we call it? Step, some people do what, they step back and step forward. It's time for you to step forward and not step back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernie. Okay, and I also wanted to acknowledge again, because this is a larger Brooklyn issue, uh, we do have colleagues from CB14 here as well. And I want to thank you for coming this evening. 
Do we have any from the community boards who are here as well? I definitely want to make sure we recognize you. Yeah, they are not here, but they are here in spirit because this is a Brooklyn thing, so you know, they're all welcome. They're here in spirit as well. All right, so we want to, to move on in the agenda. So we wanted to uh, provide an opportunity for our elected officials and representatives to, to, to give words uh, with regards to, um, to SUNY Downstate. Uh, I wanted to start off first. Uh, we are, are honored to have with us uh, this evening our Congresswoman, Yvette Clark. Chairman Baptiste and to Chairman Daly, to our Borough President Reynoso, and to our Assemblyman Cunningham, uh, to the beloved community. Uh, I'm just happy that I'm in town so that we could have this conversation together. Uh, let me start by saying that I live walking distance from SUNY Downstate and have lived there all of my life. My family credits SUNY Downstate with saving my father's life. And so this, uh, this episode that we're experiencing right now hits home uh, for me directly. And what I will share with you is that, uh, like many of you, I was informed less than 24 hours before the governor made her uh, pronouncement about what was to happen with the hospital. Of course, that didn't sit well with me, as it didn't sit well with many of you. And I know it didn't sit well with you because when I'm shopping in Western Beef, y'all calling me in the corner to tell me about SUNY Downstate. And I wanted to share with you that immediately I reached out to my colleagues at the state level, at the borough level, at the council level, because I think it's gonna take all of us working together, impressing upon our governor and her team that uh, what they have planned for us is not something that uh, we accept. Full stop. You know, I have colleagues uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, where they have the uh, world-renowned Cleveland Clinic right in the heart of a distressed community. I have colleagues who are in Minnesota where the Mayo Clinic people are flying in from around the world. So I want to know why it is that we can't transform SUNY Downstate into a world-class healthcare institution that people fly into New York City, Brooklyn, New York, Central Brooklyn, to receive healthcare. We have the talent, we have the skill, the expertise. SUNY Downstate was so uh, uh, so revered that it was given the distinction of a COVID hospital during the COVID pandemic. And I'd like to acknowledge our councilwoman has joined us, Councilwoman Crystal Hudson. Thank you. Um, and so I really believe that we are victims of neglect. When I look at the state's hospitals that they uh, oversee, uh, both of which are upstate New York, SUNY, uh, Stony Brook, and there's another hospital called Upstate uh, Hospital. They have been giving funding time and time and time again from the state of New York to meet the needs of the people of those communities. Yet, SUNY Downstate has not been given the type of support that it should have received over decades, but has still fulfilled its mission has still provided a place where its uh, medical uh, students can come to their research, can intern, um, and turn out by far the greatest number of physicians of color than any other publicly held institution in the state of New York. Without a hospital that does inpatient care, there's no way that they can maintain that distinction. If I'm given a choice and I'm filling out applications and I have a desire to serve underserved communities, but I have a choice between an institution that has an affiliated hospital where I can do my residency versus one that is gonna be shuttling me across the city of New York, 
Guess which hospital I'm gonna choose. Guess, guess which medical school I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose the one that has a hospital affiliated with. And no matter how this is presented to our community, once you end inpatient service, that's a downward spiral, not only for that institution, but for the medical school as well. And we have seen as New Yorkers, so many of our healthcare institutions shut down. Can you say Kingsbrook Jewish? You know, and it, it, it all starts out with the same, you know, let's not ruffle any feathers. Um, we're gonna provide you with all of these outpatient services. If I hear urgent care one more time, <laughs> you know, I, when you walk out your house, you're tripping over urgent care centers in this community. We need a full service hospital, full stop. And I believe that working together, we can make it a reality for us. We have been very um, deliberate in speaking to uh, the governor's office, to the chancellor of SUNY, to let them know that um, we're not going down uh, easy with this one. And I think that they've heard our cries um, in many ways. Uh, we're not anywhere near that yet, but I can tell you that the New York State Congressional Delegation stands with us in wanting to, and we, when we talk about a transformation of a hospital, we're talking about world-class hospital. We're not talking about a dismantling of healthcare services. We're talking about uh, you know, uh, centers of excellence, where for every condition in the communities that have experienced healthcare disparities, we're able to bring in experts that our medical students are able to learn from the lived experiences of people of color from around the world and how we can develop cures and treatments for the diseases that are most common in our community or the conditions. We, I've heard many of my colleagues, particularly at the state level, talk about the challenges around maternal mortality. And we know that, unfortunately, we have the distinction in the, in the, in the city of New York of having one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the nation, in the nation. And why is that? When we have a teaching hospital, we have the facilities that can do the work, that can teach what needs to be taught in order to save lives. And so I wanted to be here, to, you know, just so happened that I don't go back to Washington until tomorrow, so I'm so, it's great to be home, first of all. I get the woosa before I go back into that toxic place called Washington, D.C. <laughs> But I wanted to let you know that um, out of sight is not out of mind. The moment that uh, I was given word of uh, what the chancellor uh, had drawn up as a plan for SUNY Downstate was the moment that I snapped into action to say, not on my watch, not on my watch. I can tell you that I will fight until the bitter end to make sure that the resources we need are put in place to, like I said, uh, transform SUNY Downstate Medical Center into a world-class medical center. Part of the issue that they're constantly sharing with me is that, uh, well, you know, we, all, we serve primarily uh, Medicaid recipients or Medicare recipients, both. And my whole thing is, well, you know what? When you bring in world-class service, then people will bring their private insurance to that institution. And so we are looking at the, uh, what we can do in terms of appropriating funds at the federal level. We're trying to slow down the clock of what the governor has proposed, and it looks like we've been successful in doing that so far. That gives us the time we need uh, for the constellations in Washington, D.C. to line up the right way so that we can make the appropriations with uh, Speaker Hakeem Jeffries, who's on board to save SUNY Downstate. Oh, y'all not clapping? Speaker Hakeem Jeffries. 
makes a big difference. Right now, he's the leader, Hakeem Jeffries. We believe that it's worth the investment. Our communities deserve to have a world-class insti uh, healthcare institution. And we know, we know that SUNY Downstate is poised to do that. I've also shared with the governor, and I'm gonna wrap up, that they also have another healthcare facility not too far from SUNY Downstate, aside from Kingsborough Jewish, that has been teetering, and that's Kingsborough Psychiatric. And so there's state-owned land around us that, you know, everything doesn't have to become an apartment building. Everything doesn't, I mean, how do people who live in these buildings get service for health care in emergencies when they're saying, oh, everybody has to now go to Kings County in Central Brooklyn? It doesn't make any sense. And so uh, we're talking about a, a comprehensive plan that, again, we will all be proud of. And I, I told, uh, the governor's people, that she wants her legacy not only to be a new football stadium in Buffalo, but a state-of-the-art hospital right here in Central Brooklyn. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, uh, we also have here with us this evening, uh, I'm very honored to call up our Brooklyn Borough President, Antonio Reynoso. Thank you so much. Um, first, I just want to recognize uh, the community boards for this great work. Uh, if you ever want to know the value of the most foundational piece of civics in our community boards, this is exactly it. They got together, they put this together with no resources from my office, they did it by themselves. Uh, I can't tell you how grateful I am for them, so can we just give them a round of applause for making this happen? Um, no, I come from this, uh, from somebody that wasn't familiar with SUNY Downstate's machinations before becoming borough president and have kind of crashed course very quickly from folks about what needs to happen here. Um, I care deeply about giving folks, especially folks that are on Medicaid or Medicare, the same quality of service that they would get in a private hospital, in a public hospital. I've dedicated $45 million for state-of-the-art black maternal health systems in our public hospitals to do just that. I don't think black women should be relegated to mediocrity because of a lack of support from the systems that be our history. So I've done that. And I believe in Kings County specifically for women that have babies in a very meaningful way. And I'm going to make sure that these public hospitals are the best hospitals to have babies anywhere in the world once we're done here in my term. Uh, two years of God willing six. I uh, will see what you guys think about that. Um, the second thing I want to say is I want to give a shout out to our congresswoman. We had to meet the governor. There were no words mixed. There were no words that were confusing there. She was very clear about what this is and what this is not and what we would accept and what we would not accept. And I really appreciated that candor because there was no opportunity here for misplaced words when the, when the congresswoman was speaking. She said that this should, the governor does not want to have a fight in Central Brooklyn. Right. It's pretty much what she said. She didn't hold back. She didn't say, hey, I want to say this. But you do not want this fight in Central Brooklyn, so don't bring it. So I'm really grateful to have been there with her when she made that announcement because it, you know, once somebody gives light, other people get light. So thank you so much, Congresswoman, for that. Yes. I want to give you guys some insight as to what the looks in the rooms that we're in, that we're being called in. Um, also, I remember uh, Brian Cunningham has been working with my, me. We're looking to host meetings in Borough Hall to start addressing this issue with community leaders and our elected officials. The Congresswoman put us together in a room. We're going to see if we can continue that type of work so we can have these conversations because they tried to divide and conquer. We all got individual messages and we're shocked and surprised at the exact same time. But we're all coming together and we're working together. And so far, it doesn't seem like there's one voice out of order or out of turn in the work that we're doing to advocate. I just want to say that. Um, the next thing is that I think we need to be very careful about and be very intentional about is that it's not just about saving SUNY Downstate. It's about saving and investing in SUNY Downstate. Yes. And I, I get very concerned when I just hear save, 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 because I don't want SUNY Downstate to stay the same. I want SUNY Downstate to get better, to grow. I want the residents that are in there, the midwives that are in there, to have an opportunity to work with state-of-the-art 
facilities and work with uh, our people and make sure that people on Medicaid get the best care, we got to do better. And then we have to make sure that in 20 years, when uh, the next borough president that's right now in the third grade doesn't need a fight to save the next SUNY downstate because it ran out of money. It needs to be a sustainable model so that we can ensure the legacy of SUNY downstate. And that's what I'm fighting for. The investment is deeply important to me. I will not be happy if we just get, you know, millions of dollars for 10 years to keep things the same. That's not satisfactory to me. So we are fighting for an investment. And I'll leave you with, uh, we really want to hear from the community. It's been, I know someone said that we might get two sides. I haven't heard another side of this fight yet. Not one person has come up to me and said, hey, maybe we should close it. Or maybe it's a good idea. Or hey, slow down. Not one person yet. And hopefully today maybe we find them. But so far it seems like the, the, the community is unified, the elected officials are unified. And what I think should happen and could happen is that the governor, uh, instead of going to war with us, actually uh, becomes a partner in this work and leaves a legacy in Central Brooklyn that other governors haven't had. So thank you so much for having me. Love you all. Thank you so much, Borough President Reynoso. Okay, we also have with us uh, Council Member Crystal Hudson. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you all. I don't have a ton more to add to what's already been said, um, and I appreciate my colleagues in government um, for their leadership on this issue. Um, the one thing I'll share is that um, my best friend's father ran downstate in the 90s, from about 90 to 99. And so I called him when I first heard that downstate, about the proposal, I should say. And what he said to me was, back then in the 90s, there was a very concerted effort to invest deeply in Stony Brook. And the decision was made then to invest everything the state had into Stony Brook and not to invest in downstate. Um, and so what we're seeing now, all these years later, is the result of that where Stony Brook is a state-of-the-art medical facility out in Long Island where people are helicoptered in for trauma emergencies and things like that, and downstate is essentially the same as it was in the 90s. And so what we need to do, as everybody has said before me, is to have deep, deliberate, and intentional investments in downstate and to make sure that downstate is the world-class institution that we know it can be with that type of commitment from the state, from the federal government, from the city, from every entity we can to invest deeply in downstate. So I'm just here to stand with my colleagues and show support for um, the type of institution that we know we deserve and that we know what we can have here in Central Brooklyn. And thank you for allowing me to speak for a few minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, listen, remember, the first thing we said is we're here in the spirit of community and respect. So we're not going to do the yelling out. We're going to make sure people have an opportunity to have their say. But we're just asking for that to respect at this time. Again, Council Member, thank you very much. I know that there's a lot going on to see you all, and you took time out to come and be Absolutely. with us this evening. And I also wanted to acknowledge that we did reach out to Council Member Rita, Rita Joseph. She is actually in a budget hearing as we speak. So she sends her regrets. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, is there a representative from our office? Because I know they were trying to. Thank you very much for being here. Did you want to give any remarks on behalf of the council member or? Yeah. Sure, absolutely. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Brian Grady. I'm the director of constituent services for council member Rita Joseph. Um, and she's definitely here with us in spirit um, this evening. This very important meeting, she wishes she could be here. Unfortunately, she's in the same place she's been since 10 o'clock this morning, which is the um, education preliminary budget hearing, hearing up at City Hall. Um, so I just want to give a few remarks on her behalf. Um, our health institutions are the backbone of our communities, providing essential services and support to those in need. And Council Member Joseph vehemently opposes the closure of SUNY Downstate Hospital. The closure of SUNY Downstate would be a devastating blow to the residents who rely on its services for their health care needs. SUNY Dillon State Hospital is not just a medical facility. It is a lifeline for many in our community. It provides critical care, specialized treatments, and serves as a teaching hospital, training the next generation of healthcare professionals. 
Its closure would not only leave many without access to essential services, um, but also disrupt the education and training of future health care providers. Councilmember Joseph stands unwavering in her support to ensure that SUNY Downstate Hospital remains accessible to our community and also receives the investment it rightly deserves. She understands the vital role it plays in providing quality health care to residents, particularly those in underserved areas. Councilmember Joseph is committed to fighting against any attempts to close this essential institution and will work tires, tire, tirelessly to preserve its services for generations to come. We cannot afford to let corporate interests or budgetary constraints dictate the fate of our healthcare institutions. The closure of SUNY Downstate would have far-reaching consequences, impacting the health and well-being of countless individuals and families. Now, more than ever, we must come together to protect and preserve our healthcare infrastructure. Councilmember Joseph remains committed to working together with all stakeholders to join us in our fight to keep SUNY Downstate Hospital open. Together, we can ensure that our community continues to have access to the quality healthcare it deserves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, I want to acknowledge a little bit of protocol that has been broken uh, in terms of uh, elected officials that have been here. Uh, at this time, I do want to acknowledge one elected official who's very critical to this conversation. He came down from Albany, drove the three hours to get here to be with us to speak about his, his, um, his activities, his, what, he's, what he's doing to push in, in Albany at this time. Um, at this time, I would like to call uh, forward uh, Assembly Member Brian Cunningham. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. Um, let me first acknowledge um, the chairs, just thank you guys for hosting this event. Um, obviously, the one thing that's been missing has been community voice, so I won't be long today because I want to hear directly from you. I wouldn't drive three and a half hours to hear myself speak. Mm -hmm. um, certainly want to hear from you guys. I want to thank my colleague, particularly Congressman Clark, for your leadership on this issue. And I also see my two pastors in the back, um, Pastor Charles and Pastor Paul. If you guys can please stand, give them a big round of applause as well. The clergy have been an essential part of this conversation, as well as labor. I see Renee over here from UUP as well. Um, a lot of folks have given a lot of history on where we're coming, where we are right now. I think the history is far less important than the next 14 days. Um, in the next 14 days, the state is, set, uh, is slated to pass a budget, um, and I've committed publicly and privately to voting no on any budget that would close downstate our needed facilities. Um, where we have gotten in this conversation is I think we've gotten to a good place where we've gotten some framework for an agreement that we are still working through over the next 14 days. The framework we have actively right now is to make sure the debt for downstate, the hundred million dollars that is owed to downstate from the state, is paid. So we want to make sure that debt is taken care of this year and for future years. The second piece, which is critical, was initially the conversation around the investment downstate were predicated on the idea that we close the existing facility and open a wing in Kings County. That is now bifurcated. We are no longer having this conversation that we never had initially with the state to do one thing and change for another thing. What we're saying is that for many years, over 30 years, downstate has not been given the kind of capital or the kind of resources that it deserves, and we need to make sure we put that $300 million that the governor initially proposed to close the facility into a lockbox and to put that lockbox away and to make sure that lockbox is now committed to two things creating a CAB, which is a community advisory board, which would determine what the community actually needs. There is no way that people 160 miles away from a situation can determine what a community needs. So we want to make sure that CAB is um, first created. <laughs> the second piece of this conversation is creating a commission to study some of the history of how we got here with the finances and to study the future and what we actually need and what's going to be what was feasible to do. I know that the Congresswoman um, has committed that once we are back in a majority in the United States Congress, and that's going to happen very soon, not to be partisan, but once we have a majority and we have some federal appropriations, we can wrap the federal appropriations along with the state money, and then we can really think about what excellence looks like in Brooklyn, right? So that's where we are right now. We are putting the $300 million in a lockbox. It cannot be touched and we will wait for future investments and we'll wait for a real study to determine both the needs of the community, but also the path forward for the community. So the next 14 days, we have to kind of do what I think the borough president said and all stay together in this fight. Um, the clergy, labor, the elected officials, the community, 
um, have to stick together and stick to our, our, our guns on this one and make sure we can land this ship safely and make sure that no one gets left behind. Um, thank you all for the outpouring of support that you've shown over the last couple of months. Um, as many of you know, this plan came out, I think, on MLK Day. Um, I think me and the Chancellor had a conversation on the Thursday at about 6 o'clock in the evening. We made some recommendations to the Chancellor, and our conversation was very clear. There were three things we said in that conversation. Number one, there could be no job losses for UUB. There was, I think, projected 20% job loss. We said that's a non-starter. The second part is that we cannot move forward with an agreement without having certain stakeholders involved in that conversation. That clearly did not happen until tonight, so thank you again for bringing more people into the conversation. And the last piece is that we will make sure that when we do build something, I think to the borough president's point, that this is not something that's gonna happen in the next five years or 10 years or even 20 years, that in 40 years and 50 years, downstate still remains a, a jewel of our community. It is the fourth largest employer in the borough, it's the single largest employee in the district. And as I said from day one, downstate is going nowhere. So tonight I'm here to listen. I will have to sneak out a little early because the three and a half hour commute back to Albany. Uh, but I wanted to be here to one, listen, and to also let you know that I'm in the site with you together over the next 14 days. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay. Um... All right, we're gonna go down the list, and, and again, this is not in particular order, this is where we have sign-ins. Is there a representative from, well actually, are there any other elected officials here at this time? Any elected officials who are here? I see Serrano Purcell's trying to hide. <laughs> Did you wanna, do you have any comments that you wanna make? So thank you, Fred. Um, so I'm gonna be very brief, but um, I had the opportunity to attend a focus group meeting with Fred, a number of pastors, community leaders, Portia, you were there. And during that meeting, it was a consensus of how would we spend money received. And from that meeting, it came upon us that you are at step four when we haven't even started step one. Right? And step one was the fact that there was no community dialogue or town hall. So I want to commend you guys for hosting a town hall because out of that meeting, we spoke. We was like, we have to invite the community into the conversation, right? Because elected officials, we don't know everything, right? The information we get, we get it from the people. The people are the ones that tell us they need the services at SUNY Downstate. The people are the ones that tell us, right? how SUNY saved their life. Their family members went to SUNY. They went to school in SUNY. They started off at SUNY Downstate. And I just want to keep a couple of things in the conversation. One is capacity, that came out, right? If you go to institution, what is the capacity for the healthcare for the district? We have to remember that we came out of COVID-19, which put great strain on our hospital institutions, Kings County, and Sweet Downstate, and when we attended the Kings County breakfast, last night breakfast portion, if you, if you remember, there was a part that kind of came up where they mentioned part of the services from Sweet Downstate coming over to Kings County, and Kings County had no knowledge of taking um, inpatient. In fact, Kings County is at capacity. So as we look forward for a path to you know, support downstate, make sure that it's survived. I want to make sure that all the healthcare institutions, including in Kings County, is also a part of the dialogue because they work in sync. Because if you go to the emergency room at Kings County and it's full, you know who you're going to run to? You're going to run to downstate and vice versa. And many of you who grew up in the community, you guys know you have multiple facilities, not just one. And sometimes you have doctors at both institutions. I know I did have growing up. I know my daughter had these services. And I know many of my neighbors have too. So thank you for hosting the meeting. And thank you so much. Okay, uh, we also have a representative with us from Assemblymember Monique Chandler Waterman's office, Mr. Chris Smith. Good evening. I don't want to take a lot of time, but I have a short statement. I'll put it short for my Assemblymember. So she is currently in Albany, so she really wanted to be here, but of course, fighting their resources for our community. 
Um, and she just wanted to let you know that she's committed to advocating again for SUNY Downstate. It needs to be a community-led conversation. Um, and our community needs housing and health care, and it should not be a perception that we have to choose between the two, right? We should never have to make a choice between both of those options. Um, in New York State Assembly, they're recommending in the Assembly right now allocating 500 million, 500 million, and I believe that's 300 million in capital, and 200 million is for the current deficit that they're talking about. So it's a conversation in the budget to be able to do that. But there needs to be a bigger conversation outside of the budget on um, what we need to do for Downsey Hospital and the health care of Central Brooklyn. And she stands with all of you as your community members, as well as our colleagues, Assembly Member Brian Cunningham, as well as Senator Zelda Myrie. We're going to uni unite our voices and ensure that student downs they receive the support and investment needs to continue to be to continue being a beacon and helping care for Brooklyn. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, at this time, we also have a representative from Assembly Member Farris Front for Saltis, uh, Mr. Freeman. Is there? So Justin Freeman. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Justin Freeman. I'm the Director of Community Affairs for Assembly Member of Paris and Front Forest, which is uh, Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, Bed Stuy, Crown Heights. Um, I wanted to say thank you for Community Board 9 and 17. Um, she couldn't be here, obviously, but um, please rest assured that she's in Albany, um, you know, fighting in the last weeks of the budget process, and one of her top priorities preventing the closure um, of uh, SUNY Downstate. You know, nothing about this closure plan makes sense. It doesn't make sense to punish a hospital, as a lot of you mentioned, um, that did everything to save lives when the COVID pandemic hit. It doesn't make sense to shift patients to Kings County and Maimonides when these hospitals are struggling even more than Downstate. It doesn't make sense for the governor to say that she's concerned about black maternal health and then move to close the only four, the only level four NICU in Central Brooklyn. It doesn't make sense to cut union jobs uh, when so many in our communities are struggling with the cost of living. It doesn't make sense to close the hospital when the state has the money to invest. <laughs> Last week, the state assembly released its budget proposal, which included $200 million for downstate operating expenses. The state senate included even more funding along with a commission to study uh, downstate's needs. The assembly member will keep fighting to make sure the final budget does not move to close downstate. As a member of both the health committee and the higher education uh, uh, committee in the assembly, she's made it known to the speaker, the chancellor, and the governor that closing downstate is not an option. But we need, um, but we also need community members like you and everyone else that can't be here um, to keep fighting to stay vigilant. Hospital closures are happening all over the city, and we can learn from them. For example, Mount Sinai wants to close Beth Israel Hospital in Manhattan. The Department of Health told them that they needed state approval before they could start cutting services, but they went ahead and did it anyway. When, uh, sorry, we cannot let uh, the same thing happen at Downstate. Call the governor, call your assembly member, uh, call every elected official and let them know why Downstate matters to Thank you so much. I appreciate the time to let me speak. Thank you so much. Uh, at this time, we also have a representative from Senator Zelda Myrie's office. She yields back. Thank you very much. But she is here as well, and she will be getting word back to the senator as well for any comments and testimony that's provided this evening. But thank you again for, for coming and for the senator's support in this. Okay, and with that, we're going to, uh, well, let me ask, are there any other elected officials um, who are here, or representatives? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, Senator Marquette, they decide who to stay. From Senator Fassau's office. Thank you so much for, for being here, and please thank the Senator for his support this as well. Thank you very much for being here. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. We have Mr. Hercules Mead, Mayor's, of, uh, Mayor's Office. Hercules Reed, I can't talk. <laughs> Mayor's Office Community Affairs, thank you so much for being here this evening. Yes. Okay, we have a representative from Farrell, uh, Council Member Farrell Luce's office, thank you for being here this evening. Yes, uh, Mr. Severe? Yes, we have you as well. Did you have any words from the public happy? 
Thank you very much. Again, Mr. Sevier from the Public Advocate's Office. Mr. Reed, did you have any comments for the Mayor's Office or? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to say anything more. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here this evening. Okay, all right, at this time we're going to move. Um, there have been other stakeholders who have been active in this conversation um, with regards to downstate. We wanted to hear from a few of them this evening as well to share the information, because I think that's one of the things we've talked about. There have been, there's been little, little information in terms of some of the causes or what some of the issues are, so we wanted to be able to share that with the community to hopefully color some of the conversation. Uh, so at this time, what I would like to do is I would ask, like to ask uh, Dr. Donald Moore to please come to the front and share with us uh, some words. Uh, Dr. Moore is with the State of SUNY Downstate Coalition. Uh, good evening, and um, some of you may have seen me before, practice in medicine. Um, I actually uh, have been into more houses in Brooklyn than most, most anybody else, because I have made house calls for the last 35 years in Brooklyn and Manhattan. As a matter of fact, back in 2000, I wrote an article for the Yale Alumni Magazine 10,000 house calls and still counting. Well, my um, interest in this is because of my involvement in healthcare planning and so on. Healthcare planning, healthcare systems. So, in addition to being a doctor that goes and takes care of patients, I also look at the broad system. And I can tell you, I clearly listened with uh, interest to Chancellor John King when he said that we're gonna close downstate because it loses money. Of course, downstate is gonna lose money. If you label a hospital a hospital of last resort, if you label a hospital as a safety net hospital, by definition, that hospital is gonna lose money. Uh, back in, uh, I think, March, April of 2020, when COVID came, our Congress member Clark asked me and a couple of colleagues to check out what was going on in central Brooklyn. How, what was going to be the impact? Well, we did check it out. We went to Downstate and we spoke to the CEO of Downstate. And you know what she said? She said, well, our problem is we're a COVID hospital and nobody wants to come here. I heard the same thing happen over at Kings County. Well, the chancellor also said that uh, there is no occupancy at Downstate. Well, of course, if you're a COVID hospital, if you're a last resort hospital, if all of that, of course you may have no occupancy. Well, that's to be determined. But the most important thing I think the chancellor said that struck me was that this hospital was in disrepair. It had a poor physical plant. Well, if you have a poor physical plant, you fix it. If it needs to be demolished, demolish it. But build it back and build it back better. So what do we want in Brooklyn? We don't want a 100-bed hospital on the campus next door over at Kings County. Kings County has a hospital. What we want is the replacement of what Downstate has been to Brooklyn. That's a tertiary care hospital. A tertiary care hospital is where you do transplants. A tertiary care hospital is where you take care of high-risk babies. A tertiary care hospital is where you do surgery, heart surgery, and so on, and so on, and so on. In this empire state, you mean we can't have a tertiary care, highly functioning hospital in the most populous county of the state? Of course we should. So that's what we ought to do. We ought to, okay, if you want to tear it down, tear it down, but don't make houses. Build back a hospital that's going to serve the people in Brooklyn. And that is really my message. My message is the principles of the plan should be not to tear it down and set up some outpatient, what was that you called it? Urgent care. Urgent care center, you know, on the block. We've got too many of them. What we need is a high 
quality, some, I think some folks said state of the, uh, the world class, state of the art, but my term is tertiary care center, that's what it is. It's what happens when you go through primary care, that's the urgent care center, and they say, you're really sick. They send you to the hospital, to the emergency room. That's your secondary care. But once you got to the emergency room, they did real tests and found out that you may die. You need tertiary care. And we don't want you shipped to Manhattan. We want you taken care of right here in Brooklyn. And that's what they do. That's what they do at the Albert Hospital. If you go to Presbyterian, New York, Presby New York Methodist, New York Presbyterian Brooklyn Methodist Hospital, where I am. If you go there and you're really sick, you know what happens? You go in an ambulance and you go to Manhattan. If you have diseases that require real sophisticated medicines, you go to Sloan Kettering, you go wherever. So in Brooklyn, we want to stay here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Okay, this time I would also like to call uh, up um, a representative from the United University Professor Professions Downstate Chapter, UUP, Dr. Raditha Abrahams Nichols. Hello, everyone. Thank you to the chairs. And I want to say to all the legislators in the audience, not one of you, when I've called you or reached out to you, have not sat and spoke to me about the issues at Downstate. I first would like to say that I came to Downstate in 2001. Not only do I represent UUP, I'm also a member of the community. And when I came in 2001, there was no emergency room. It was um, ACRC. And I came because the, her name, the director of nursing there, Robin Pino said that we were going to open the ER so we could sustain the hospital. The plan was to use the emergency room to generate resources to save the hospital. Since then, there's been the Burger Commission. Mm -hmm. They had had been pit management that came, mm -hmm. and you know they got rid of 20 percent of people that we had to subsequently rehire because it was unsafe. Mm -hmm. So we've been through this over and over again, and I've heard what everybody said. And it's the truth. We not only need to save the hospital, it needs to be a sustainability plan. So I came in 2001. I worked in the ER. Everyone left. I stayed because I wanted to be in my community. This is where I wanted to be. I became nurse in leadership. I was the nurse manager in the ED. I watched a lot of people die. I watched us having 53 admissions in, in that tight ED turning the pediatric ED into adult uh, patients, the fast track. I was there that whole time. I worked 16 hours every single day, slept at downstate, and then had to double as nursing supervision. I was there through all of this. And then to get this news that they want to close us. I'm looking at this literature that the chancellor has provided. It is not true. Because one of the things is, a bed is not a bed is not a bed is he counting the patients that have to stay in the ER in the hallway when he's putting this number of 155. He is not counting that. Is he counting that the fact that when we have to make room single because of isolation, that the number is that way because of that reason? Is he counting that the last, the last month, there have been people in the ER for three days? Who is looking at those numbers? And who is on his team that actually works at Downstate, that has been there and know what's going on? I will tell you, the members, the, the workforce at Downstate feel a little hopeless sometimes because we have met with people. We've gone with our faith based leaders to Albany. We were told we were going to hear something by now. What is going to happen? There has been silence. There is no reason why Downstate should go away. Urgent care, you need, um, you need insurance to go to the urgent care center. Can our migrants walk into the urgent care center and get seen right away? Where are they going to go? Are we going to have people dying in the streets of New York? They just closed Kingsborough. Saying that these beds are not full is not right. And you know, I was thinking about this today, right? And so the national defense system, right? We haven't had a war in how long? Don't they still keep missiles? Just in case something happens? Don't they still fund the missiles? Do they still fund the army? And so we're saying we're not going to fund health care, something that we need? Um, our population is growing, buildings are everywhere. And this is what we're doing to a hospital 
we decided that everyone needs to go to ambulatory care. Since COVID, who, where, where's the research after COVID of what is happening with people in the community? You know, all these new infections are popping up. Who is doing that research? And why are we using data from 10 years ago to decide to close a hospital? I have not seen a plan. Where is the plan? How are we closing that? Where's the plan? Why has no one seen the plan? Where's the transparency? I will tell you that we are co-hosting a meeting on Friday, another community meeting. We are doing what the state of New York and the governor and the chancellor has not done. There were three focus groups at Downstate. One of them was for people in the community. I walked down there and I said, I work, live in this community. They said, your name is not on the list. Mm -hmm. So does my name have to be on a list to say that I live in this community? Mm -hmm. Does my name need to be on the list so I can have a voice in what's going on? Where is the voice of the people? And what I hear from the chancellor is that you're upset because you're going to be job loss. No, I'm not upset. I can get a job. I'm upset because the people of Central Brooklyn deserve a hospital. And we're not going to stand by. We've done this before. They kind of did the okie dokie with Kingsbrook, right? They did the okie dokie. So if, if this happens twice, shame on us the first. Shame on you, us now, the second time. The first time they did it, we let it go. We are not going to let it go. I saw, I was online, you know, something was posted about what we did at the church. And someone said, from Kingbrook, why no one fought for them? It's because we didn't know. We didn't know that they're not transparent. We didn't know that they're not telling us the truth. We need the truth. We need to see the plan. And it does need to be a sustainability plan, not a closure plan. And if you look in the dictionary on the what is a hospital, it does not say ambulatory care. It says a hospital has beds where people go for a certain kind of treatment. So whatever he's saying, you can't transform a hospital to not a hospital. That's not how it works. Thank you. Doctor, could you give me information for that uh, meeting you said before? Um, it's March 22nd. So it's March 22nd, 5 p.m. at PS 235 from 5 to 7 p.m. I hope to see everyone there. Okay. Okay. Right, we're going to get that information. We'll try and make sure we disseminate that as well. It's important for us to be at these meetings to make sure that all these viewpoints are heard. Uh, but thank you again, very much again for the time. Um, and, and, and Dr. Abraham Nichols also mentioned during that faith leaders who have been very much a part of this conversation as, as well. I want to thank them for their, their, you know, their contributions, for taking the time, for not just tending to their flocks, but also making sure that social justice is a part of the conversation as well. Uh, we have two members as well that we would like to bring up to the front to uh, speak with us this evening. First, I'd like to ask Pastor Galbraith if you would come and just say a few words. Okay, he's deferred Pastor Cohol. If you would please come to the front. I think either of us could speak. But uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you, gentlemen, for uh, having us here. We, as members of the clergy, we are, I think, the only group, or maybe the only group, that have the privilege of speaking to hundreds of people each week. And we see our mission larger than just preparing people for heaven. We gotta live our lives right here on this earth. And so we have taken on the stand that we need to be a part of this conversation. My church is just one block over from SUNY Downstate, the Lenox Road Baptist Church. And I believe our church was the first location this year that started the conversation with the chancellor. And there were so many issues that came up. One of the things that we found out later on was that the level of transparency was not there. And so we pushed back hard and we uh, joined with the unions. And I just want to thank uh, Renee, that, that was a powerful, powerful speech here because the impact statement of the closure of Downstate is so great when you hear the personal stories. Those who are directly affected by this plan. 
And so, as I, as I, as I heard a few of the elected officials speak uh, earlier on, our Congresswoman and our Assemblyman, uh, Brian Cunningham, I, I, for a moment, I said, well, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And then, when I heard my sister here speak, I said, I hope it's not the freight train that's coming. But one of the things I am so very, very, very thankful for as a member of the clergy is that this community has been pushing back hard. And we are standing up. And no one, it doesn't matter how high or mighty you are, you will not have the privilege of disrespecting Central Brooklyn. And we are going to continue the fight. It doesn't matter how long it takes. And we will continue the fight until we get the very best outcome. When, when the state does its homework, and I believe that numbers were just thrown around without adequate um, finding out what would, what would the, be the real cost. And so when the state gets its numbers and its act together, I think, and show us the respect that we need as a community and that we fight to the very bitter end, then I believe we would be able to, as, a, as, as different groups, say yes, we did everything possible and this is what we got. So the clergy, the church is standing with, the, um, with this community, we're standing with the unions and we're standing for SUNY downstate. Thank you, Dr. Kolal, and thank you uh, to Chair Newport 90, my chair, Newport 17, uh, serve as the pastor of Alliance Tabernacle Clarity Road Church here in Central Brooklyn, also a member of Community Board 17, and to my colleague, uh, as well as uh, our senior leader in regards to this fight, I also echo his reflections. Uh, I'm someone who serves, and I see some even some of my members here today, as someone who serves as a, in a congregation that has folks who have been educated at SUNY Downstate, uh, folks who are patients of SUNY Downstate, as well as individuals who are employed at SUNY Downstate. Uh, so I have to stand before my people every week. We also have a senior center. I've got to see them every day. And I've let uh, the electeds know, as well as others know, the community, our people are not having it. I hear from them each and every moment, and they are letting us know very clearly that they want their hospital, they have this need, this is talking about people's lives. Uh, as we've reflected this, we've uh, carried this message to anybody and everybody. We've done our due diligence within the clergy to have meetings and reflections concerning uh, the work that needs to be done, but we want to be good partners with the community and say it's not our decision, it's not, we're not going to divide up one another, we're not going to pit one another against each other, but rather we want to come at the table, we're all going to eat at the table, we're all going to be able to hear what's taking place and to move this forward. The next thing I've got to lift up, I know, listen, I'm just a corner preacher, I'm not a healthcare professional, I'm not a, uh, a professional in regards to uh, finance, and I understand and recognize the reality of the resources that are needed. Uh, but the last time I checked, Reverend, uh, that, that, that the foundation of the hospitals was founded within faith communities. Last time I checked, Hospitals were not here to make money. Hospitals were here to save lives. And so what we're looking for is to make sure that our institutions do what they're called to do and serve the communities that we are called to be responsible for. So we're gonna keep up the fight, whether we've gotta be in the boardroom or on the street, we're gonna be here. And so we're thankful for the support and the continued work that's continuing to take place. Thank you. Pastor said they will not have the privilege of disrespecting Central Brook. That's right. I would drop the mic, but we're broke, so <laughs> we can't afford another. All right, at this time, uh, I want to thank all the elected officials who have come up and, and spoken about the fights that they, are, they have taken up and are going to continue. I want to thank all those community partners who have, who have talked about the issues that are going on, the issues on the ground, and the organization that's happening in the community. And I thank you for, for all the things that you've done and that we're all going to be doing together. Um, but at this time, we're going to open up the floor now for that public commentary. I know we've heard from a lot of people who have been here already, but we wanted to make sure that we heard from the community. Um, Dante, I think, how many people have we had signed up? Well, actually, let me, let me do this. Is there anybody who's not signed up who does wish to speak? 
Okay, so we see, oh, Ms. Fleming, is that you? Yeah. Okay, all right. We'll make sure we get you in a second. I'll add you to the list. So we're gonna call up uh, names. First we have, um, Oh, I know you. you know. <laughs> we can have uh, Miss Agnes Roberts. All right, and only because we do need to respect the space once we get out, we ask everyone limit your comments to two minutes. But if you do want to have other conversations, we can definitely talk after. So Ms. Roberts, here we go. Good evening, everyone. I just want to let everyone know here, I've been in this community since 1977. My daughter was born at Downstate Hospital. My granddaughter was born at Downstate Hospital. Mm. And I refuse to allow Governor Hochul to close Downstate. She has to remember, she's up for re-election. <laughs> okay? <laughs> she is going to be up for election at some time. And she is going to remember the black and brown people of Central Brooklyn, and that's all I got to say. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to move on in the uh, on the list. So we're going to have Mr. Cheryl Bernard, and after that, we have Mr. Asher Cunningham who's going to speak after. So Mr. Cunningham, you come to the front. And we'll see Good evening, everyone. Did everyone get a flyer? Okay, it's kind of explaining what's going on. I am here, yes, for Downstate, but I'm also here about what they're going to do in the area. I have two minutes, I don't have a lot of time. I have lived in my home for, since 1972. My son, who is 32 this year, was born in Downstate. So guess what? They closed Kingsburg on blocks from Kingsburg. They're threatening Downstate. In addition to, if you've looked at the fly I've given you, they're gonna build 13 apartment buildings in our neighborhood within a five block radius. I didn't say one, I didn't say two. I can count until I'm blue in the face till I get to 13. And then they are 10 stories high. Do you all know that? 10 stories high. So closing two hospitals, building more saturation, there's no parking spots, no one is listening to us. I, I mean, no one. I have contacted every agency. My Rizal North office, Yvette Clark, Letitia James, Darlene Mealy, Rita Joseph, Brian Cunningham, whose office is the only one who ever responds. Thank you, Sydney. You are awesome wherever you are. But even, even with Brian Cunningham's office that he sent to the governor, it's a sugar-coated, sweet, cute letter that has no urgency to it. Talk to the constituents. I know that our borough president is here. He likes housing. Everyone likes housing. And just like all you will be affected by downstate if it closed, we're going to be affected when they put 13 apartment buildings up within a five block radius of my home. Can you imagine there's no parking? I, I, please come to the website, to my Zoom. I'm going to have a Zoom again this Wednesday. I will just explain everything that's been going on. I know my time is short. Please, some elected officials, please hear us. Talk to me. Talk to us. We can tell you, yes, we need housing. We need housing. But do you know in Creedmoor, over 58 acres, 58 acres, they're building up 2,500 units. But over seven acres, they're building up 1,100. Do y'all, can y'all do the math? We're in a school. Ask one of the students. 58 acres, they're building 2,500 with parking. And some of the units have two parkings each. Go on the website. I have the information, but in our neighborhood, no parking. But you know what they're giving us, right? Bike Thanks. spots. Bike spots. Bike spots. Yeah, election is coming. And if I have to walk every day to tell people what's going on, I will do it. Can someone please hear us? We know buildings need to be going up. Talk to me. Look for me. Please. I have a QR code on my back. <laughs> That's not serious. This is what's coming the less. We're already scared with what's coming out of neighborhood. Y'all should see what we have to deal with. The men's shelter is across the street from us. Do you, you have no idea what we deal with. You have no idea. And you only know if you talk to us. So everything y'all saying, all your pastors are talking about the neighborhood. What the pastor say? That, that killed me. I know Simon, I, he said, unless you're directly affected. Everything y'all said about downstate, we're saying about our neighborhood. It's going down. Do y'all see the lawlessness? Do y'all see the lawlessness in this state? You think closing down a hospital is bad? 
Wait till they build these up, leave them in the hospital stage. I'm telling y'all, if y'all don't wake up, somebody contact us, come on my website. I know I gotta go. Fred is tired of me. I know Brian is tired of me. I know he's tired of me. I know he's tired of me. But trust me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I need a real letter to this governor to let her know the seriousness of what's going on. Just how y'all fight for the downstate? Can y'all fight for us? Oh my God, why do you think no one's here from say no? It might be one person here from say no. Maybe, is anyone here from say no? Except Miss Agnes who spoke, and she spoke about Dowsley. She probably gave up too with y'all hearing us. Because she was up there fighting. But she probably gave up because no one cares about us. No one. No one cares. Don't cry. Don't cry. And I'll be brief, you know, when I heard that downstate is closing, what came to mind is, you know, we don't bring to the conversation about the high school students who would also be affected. So I graduated from Clara Barton in 2007. And what many people won't know is that Clara Barton High School, so when I was at Clara Barton High School, I graduated as a medical assistant. And most of these students go to Clara um, Downstate, that's where they do their clinicals, that's where we have we graduate nurse practice, nurse LPNs from Clara Barnu. They do a lot of these studies at Downstate Hospital. And so I think when we're talking about Downstate, we also have to think about the impacts of um, high schools and schools like Clara Barnu High School. So that's why I stand here today and advocate that Downstate need to remain open. So, Committee Board 17 is with Downstate remaining open and also let's think about the high schools and the education that is affected with Downstate closing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if we can have uh, Ms. Karen Fleming. My name is Karen. My children call me Citizen Karen. I'm not on any boards. I don't belong to anybody. But I did, three years ago, fight to keep Kingsbrook Hospital open. And we fought hard. If you don't believe me, go and look to 228.22 on the front page of Crane's New York Business. It's me there talking about the closing of that hospital. Now, I look up and I sit and I say, Closing downstate. I said, how are they going to do that? What? I had a broken leg. I was treated there. My son had two surgeries on his shoulders. He was treated there. My other son had football injury. He was treated there. 
Why are we closing this hospital? Why, when we know, when we know that they have been starving this hospital for funds that could go to the hospital for years, not minutes, that's the same thing that happened to King's book. Now I did the fancy dance and ride a dog when, we, when they were doing with King's book. Over here, I'm not going for it this time. Not a second time. Now I don't mind fighting. I was the president of a labor union, and you know labor union presidents do one or two things. I tell people this all the time. I was a small union, but still, I was still the head chick in charge. Labor union presidents do one or two things. They either smooth things over, or they raise hell. Which one do you want? I have capabilities either side of the road. We're not doing this this time. Not when some of the best professional people that I have ever seen practicing medicine are serving this community. Where is the hospital going? Where is the hospital going? Why? There is no why. The only thing to keep that from happening is us. The citizens, the politicians, yes, I understand. You can go to Albany and you can fight and you need to be careful where you're walking because believe you me, they are putting roadblocks in your way that you can't even see. They are parting the ways for you to fall into that you can't even see. Trust me when I tell you they are doing that because that's what happened with, with one Brooklyn Health. We fight on Brooklyn, okay? People weren't watching. When we were fighting, we didn't even know that we couldn't win the war. But I don't mind fighting, so I was fighting anyway. We didn't know that we couldn't win the war because the, the cement was dry. It was already poured and dry. This is not that situation. The only thing to stop that is not only what you got to do when you go upstate and what you got to do when you go to City Hall, it's what we got to do as the people. And the biggest thing we have is that piece of paper where we bubble in. That's our power. And let them know that we will use that power. I'm talking to you, Hoko. <laughs> You all don't want to see school safety yell at you, so I ask you two minutes when you speak, please. Thank you. The truth is I wasn't going to come this evening. One of my girlfriends insisted that I came. I'm going to talk from several perspectives. I'm a community stakeholder. I own a home in this community. I worked at Downstate um, back in the day. As a matter of fact, about it. When they first started their ARC, they recruited me to be one of the first nurses and I declined and I went to Maimonides instead. And to some extent, I kind of regretted that because while I was at Maimonides, they closed St. Mary's and they gave Maimonides 180 million cut money. I was at Brooklyn Jewish, they closed Brooklyn Jewish yeah. also. Yeah. We need to watch the patterns. Our neighborhood is being changed and the services are being removed. Now ask yourself that. Does that add up to you? Does it add up to you that Dumpstead, when we work, when I worked there back in 2000, I left Dumpstead in 2002, the, the hospital was already in bad disrepair. Nobody was <coughs> listening to us. As nurses, we were begging them to give us better services for these patients. Nobody was listening to us. They're still not listening to us, but you have to watch the history. Before I went to work at Downstate, we couldn't go to Downstate unless we had a doctor that had privileges at Downstate in order for us to go to Downstate. So we only had the option to go to Kings County. Now they're taking away the options. The neighborhood has changed considerably since we started nursing. Now we're coming back to see the neighborhood is changing again. And so why are we moving what our options? If you're building so many buildings, 
Where are people going to get care? You have to look at it in the context of what's happening. What just happened? We had a pandemic. What's going to happen in the next pandemic? Where are people going to go? To the urgent seconds. care centers? They're not going to get the care in the urgent care centers. They couldn't even get them in the hospitals. So if you're going to remove the hospitals out of the community, are we going to be able to bus to Manhattan or to Queens to get care? Guys, we need to think about these things. We need to think about what's really, really happening. Open your eyes and you will see, look where the money is flowing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I apologize, but we actually have to start wrapping up. Uh, there are just a couple more comments we need to get in. One person I do want to recognize, we have one of our district leaders, Kel Williams. Kel, did you want to say a couple of uh, quick remarks? Very brief, because uh, we do have to respect the space, we need to leave soon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Akal Williams, and I'm the male district leader for the 43rd Assembly District. Um, just a couple of things. Um, I stand firmly in saying do not close downstate. Um, we lost Kingsburg Hospital late last year, uh, leaving two hospitals in central Brooklyn, right? So downstate and also Kings County. Now we're, you know, based on what we're seeing, it's possible that downstate could be closed. Now, with all the development that's planned, you know, that's happening and planned to come, what happens when you reduce hospital capacity, but you increase the residents that, that's there? So even if we don't understand all this like complicated budget, you know, the budget stuff behind how the hospitals operate, I think it's common sense that if you increase people and you decrease medical capacity, what happens, right? Um, also, like the entire rollout of this entire process was a bit troubling. Like, uh, if any one of you had the pleasure to see it, Senator Zelma Omari held a hearing where, when questioning the New York State Health Commissioner, James McDonald, he stated that he heard about this plan in the news. To me, that's crazy. How can the Chief Medical Officer for the State of New York find out about downstate closing in the news? That's crazy. So that says to me, that's something, you know, how the rollout came out, no one did their due, due diligence or did what they were supposed to do. Um, and then lastly, you know, I'm wondering, like, the, the, the talking points that they're given to us, and when I was at Lenox Road Baptist Church and the Chancellor came, and, you know, we had, I had a chance to speak to him and ask questions in a public, so, so a semi-public, uh, I guess you can say, meeting just like this, uh, I asked him, I said, you know, what's the plans for, like, the property? Because at least when I was in, politi in my political science course, as they told you, you want to know the truth about anything? Follow the money, right? And in my head, we all know if you're from Central Brooklyn, development is one of the key for myself. Um, and I would say lastly, uh, they're saying, you know, move us to Kings County's campus. At the legislative breakfast on March 8th, when I raised the question about, you know, what about if downstate was to close? Kings County had a legislative uh, breakfast on uh, March 8th, and I raised the question. The response that I got was essentially, where would we put them? Unless we're going to build up, you know? So it's like, there's a lot of, I, you know, I have more questions than answers, and I think that's why everyone's here. Um, and I think that's about it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so we've concluded with our program this evening. I want to thank everyone who's come this evening. I apologize that we're in a rush, we only need to work in respect the space. But I do want to again thank our Congresswoman Yvette Clark. I want to thank Senate Member Brian Kennedy. I want to thank Council Member Kristen Hudson, who is here as well. I want to thank our board president, Antonio Reynoso, who is here as well, has joined us in the fight. I want to thank our district leaders who have come with us this evening. I want to thank um, the district office team for putting this together so quickly. I want to thank Principal Sean Rice and the High School for Public Service for hosting us and allowing us to be in the space. I want to give a special acknowledgement to my committee board, Brooklyn Committee Board 9. Thank you so much for coming to CB17, Committee Board 14 again. Um, and if anyone wishes to give additional testimony, please feel free to contact the district offices directly. You can reach CB9 at BK09-1 at cb.nyc.gov. Uh, again, I want to thank everyone for coming this evening. Chair Daly, you have any questions? Just, uh, again, just to reiterate, thank you everybody. Also, just all the elected officials that you have in marching order, and please utilize that marching order, and make sure that both Community Board 17 and Community Board 9 are sitting at the table to have the conversation, because we have the community's best interests at heart. So, 
all of our elected leaders and everyone in here. And I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you. So thank you again for being with Thank you. Thank you for being with Secretary and all of the elected officials. Have a great night, everyone. Looking forward to seeing you. Good night. Just stand adjourned.